uh, 4.30, so we're going to get started. I just wanted to give a quick um, shout out that um, Ryan Lancio is also doing a talk that is also vaguely about JavaScript fatigue, but coming from a different angle. He's talking about it from an open source maintainer perspective, whereas I'll be talking more about a consumer of node things and development things in general. So if you're more interested in, in, in hearing about um, you know, maintaining open source projects, he is in Ezel 301. Thanks, Lance. Um, yeah, this is uh, how to avoid JavaScript fatigue and sleep well at night. Um, really appreciative of Will and the gang for asking me to talk. I kind of came in last minute after they had some people who needed to get substitutes. Um, this is me. I'm Josh Mock. Pretty much everywhere. Mostly active on Twitter, but you can find me on most of the things. Snapchat, my name is different, but you probably don't care. I don't, I don't do anything on Snapchat. I mostly just... <laughs> I, <laughs> I follow um, DJ Khaled. That's about all it's for. Um, <coughs> I just started a website called JavaScriptFatigue.club. I was literally editing it last night before this. Um, I'm going to have a newsletter I'm going to start sending out pretty soon, but... Um, Right now, it's just a, a tech blog, yet another tech blog. And I do front-end architecture here in Nashville at Emma, um, helping teams get uh, figure out the tools that they are either being asked to use or when they pick tools for themselves, helping them pick the right ones and um, stop stressing about it. So that's why I'm here to talk to you, because I want to help you not stress out about the tools that you have either been asked to use or the tools that you're being asked to pick. Um, and this is really important. Um, this isn't just um, really great pictures of my family. That's my wife, Erin, and my son, Truman. Truman just turned two a week ago. Um, he is awesome. My wife and I just celebrated our fifth wedding anniversary two days ago. Um, so they are, they are the people I like to spend my free time with, um, along with these two crazies. On the left is um, that's Lila. She was born with a cleft lip. Um, along and her siblings, they had a genetic defect. We rescued her from a really bad abuse situation. We think she was probably a bait dog. Um, she's one of the smartest dogs I've ever met. I'm almost positive she's not actually a dog. <laughs> and, <coughs> and then on the right is Jasper and me hanging in the backyard. He's definitely a dog. He's about as, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a dog. Uh, he's also a rescue. We do a lot of rescue work um, with um, East Can, which is an, a local program that um, get stray dogs off the streets in East Nashville. We foster for them. Um, fostered a lot. We've probably fostered like 20 or 30 dogs over the past four or five years. Um, it's really, really valuable work to us, and it's what we like to spend our spare time on, not JavaScript. <laughs> um, I also am a volunteer DJ at WXNA. Casey Reed is right here. He is also a volunteer DJ at WXNA, um, where every Friday night I spin weird music at 10, from 10 to 11 p.m over the airwaves of Nashville. Um, these are the things I like to spend my time on when I'm not working. I spend eight hours a day thinking about code, writing code, helping other people figure out what to do with their code. I don't want to do that when I get home. And so, um, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, the state of JavaScript 2016, who has seen this survey? It came out like a month ago, maybe? Um, Stateofjs.com, you can probably pull it up right now. It's very, very informative. I've been looking at it a lot. Um, this is one of the opinion poll questions that came up. Um, is building JavaScript apps, apps overly complex right now? And well over half voted from three to five. So a resounding yes. Um, the JavaScript ecosystem is changing too fast. A again, a resounding yes, well over three quarters of the people um, said so. Now this one's really interesting. I don't understand how this works with that sentiment, but JavaScript is moving in the right direction. <laughs> Also a resounding yes. So <laughs> there's this attitude of like, holy shit, everything's moving too fast. But at the same time, I think it's the right direction. I'm just having trouble keeping up is kind of what I get from that. Um, and so, you know, you can just try to like, like latch onto that and really try to um, just like try to find your way in and just take the fire hose of information that comes to you every day from every possible information source. Or you can like chill out and use the virtue that makes a good programmer a good programmer, and that is being lazy by going to great effort to re reduce your overall energy expenditure, which is a really hard sentence to say. There's a lot of ease. Um, that's from 3virtues.com by Larry Wall, which is like the most simple website of all time. Um, the first thing that's really important when you're getting into trying to figure out 
um, what to pay attention to in the JavaScript ecosystem, but development in general. And um, the best thing you can do is kind of practice these critical thinking skills and find some tools to help you separate signal from noise. What are the most important tools that I can use to do my job? What are the tools that are just coming across the radar because there's literally like a thousand places you can go to find the hottest and latest libraries um, that may or may not solve your problem, but they're all there and you're like, holy shit, how do I like sift out the stuff I actually need right now? Um, the first thing I always do is like, I subscribe to all the newsletters, so I get JS Weekly and Node Weekly, and there's, I think there's a React Weekly now, and then there's Echo JS is like kind of like Hacker News, except it's not Hacker News. I've blocked ha Hacker News in my Etsy host file because like, it's not worth it. Um, <coughs> but it's basically Hacker News, but just for JavaScript developers. Um, so there's a lot of headlines going on over there. There's like a subreddit just for JavaScript. There's a ton of places to get the information. The trick is to not click on any of them. It's just to read the headlines. Um, so the, 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 um, the effect of that is that you get a sense, you kind of keep your, your finger on the pulse instead of drowning in a, a sea of information you don't actually need. So you can see, like, if you go look through the last three months of JS Weekly newsletters, you can probably make a word cloud and see that React pops up a whole lot more than Angular does. Um, and if you look at the results from that state of JS survey, it seems to be that people are moving away from Angular and toward React. You can say the same thing about like Backbone and all that stuff. The things that people were using, but have put down in favor of other tools. So if you're interested in picking a tool for a new project, that's a great way to um, keep track of what's popular right now. What are the tools that are going to be the easiest to find help with because of those people are interested in using them right now. Um, another critical thinking skill is learning when to stop reading. If you do click on an article, which is still important sometimes, um, if, you, if your brain says, I think I get it, or I don't think I need this right now, those are two good clues to maybe just put the article down. Maybe bookmark it and come back to it later. Um, I, I bookmark a lot of stuff and put it in Evernote just because it's all searchable, but a lot of times I'll skim an article and say, that's really great, but I don't need to know how, like, you know, promise.all works right now. So I'm just going to go put it in Evernote, and when I need it, I can just do a search for promise.all, and I'll find that page again. Um, the Evernote Web Clipper cosine, um, you can clip entire web pages and save them to Evernote and search them, which is really cool. Um, this is another one that's been really useful for me. This is just a list of experts that um, I particularly enjoy, but they're people who tend to talk more about um, being a good developer, or they're people who do the work of separating signal from noise and helping you think critically and say, these are the important things that um, we see as trends because a lot of these people are um, software architects or um, authors who spend a lot of time working in the tech community, or like Adi Osmani, he actually works at Google as a developer advocate, and um, so his whole job is to basically know the ecosystem. So lean on them, follow them on Twitter, or like a lot of them have their own newsletters. Um, use those as a place to find the thoughtfulness that is not found just in lists of links of new tools to check out. Um, and then another good thing to help you with finding, separating signal from noise, especially for the more like, if you're newer in your career, it's really important to have a mentor for other reasons, but especially just have someone that you can bounce ideas off of. You say, hey, I'm starting a new web app. What do you think about using um, jQuery UI? Pulling something from like five years ago. Uh, and they would probably say that. They'd probably like, well, you can. It depends on like your needs. If you're just like trying to do something really simple, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you have like a ton of business logic, maybe pick something that's a little more robust like React or Angular or Backbone. Um, and finding people who have the experience to give you good advice like that is essential. Um, another really important critical thinking skill is called chunking. This is um, a tool I pulled from a Coursera course that I took this past year called Learning How to Learn. Um, it's really about figuring out the best ways not to just memorize data, but to actually um, take the important concepts out of the things that are coming across your radar and um, categorizing them. So the whole idea is to basically take um, collections of concepts and group them into ideas. So I can say, you know, like, like it's easier to say, oh, um, Angular and Vue.js both use the concept of two-way data binding. I'd rather care more about 
that's the problem that they solve, two-way data binding, than to know like the ins and outs of Angular or Vue. When it's time, then I'm like, hmm, I have a problem in front of me, and having two-way data binding would be a really useful way to solve that problem. Then I go, maybe I should go look at AngularJS or Vue. Um, I don't know Angular or Vue. I just know what they are because I use <laughs> uh, critical thinking skills like this to help. Um, <clears throat> This is a really good way to think about it. The English language has 25,000 verbs in the dictionary and 12 different verb tenses. You can either memorize 300,000 words and how to use them in all the different tenses, or you can just memorize the 25,000 verbs in probably not even that many, and the rules of conjugation. I would much rather know the underlying rule for why something works than um, to know the ins and outs of every single little tool to, um, to do a job, because like, um, memorizing stuff rarely gives you the depth of knowledge to be able to go home and um, rest at night. So, you know, like, I, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Um, learning the fundamentals. This is just, uh, it's really kind of goes along with the idea of chunking. It's that understanding the, the core programming concepts behind an idea um, help you to find those patterns. So when I say that like I see something um, uses two-way data binding, I can say, oh, that's just a concept from the idea of reactive programming, because I, I read a few articles about reactive programming a couple years ago, and I see that this is a pattern that's pretty common in front-end development. Um, or I see like um, Backbone, it's like, oh, well, that's just like a pretty straightforward MVC. Like that is probably one of the most common patterns that we all already know. But digging a little bit deeper and finding the tools and patterns that have persisted across literally generations of developers. Most of the tools, like MVC is a tool from like the 70s, um, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but I'm not a historian. But um, it's been around for a very long time, and so uh, being able to understand that people are reusing these fundamental ideas to solve certain problems is really helpful. Um, here's a list of JavaScript code patterns that I pulled from Adi Osmani's book, Learning JavaScript Design Patterns which is an awesome read. It's a few years out of date. I would probably add um, Flux to this, but other than that, um, Flux is a big deal because it kind of shook a lot of that up. It's like a, a different pattern, but even that, the whole idea of React and Flux came from um, computer game programming, that, like an idea that's been used for decades in computer game programming because they needed optimized ways to only re-render the things that change, and then from there you, you maintain your state somewhere else, and that's where Flux came from. But all of these um, core design patterns are things that are reused over and over and over again. A module is just, it's what ties together CommonJS, ES6 modules, RequireJS slash AMD. All of these different things that have kind of come and go, you can say, well, oh, it's a module system. Okay, well, I know what modules are. That's all I need to know about that for right now until it's time to get into the nuts and bolts of something. Um, observers and mediators, that's a lot of it. It's just like, what is PubSub? Um, that's a, like another name for like a similar idea to those things. It's really just understanding that there's a core pattern there that, um, that you can use to really make sense of it because a lot of um, libraries expose like event-based publishing and subscribing to feeds of data. Um, yeah, so that's just a really useful way to help. When you recognize these patterns, you start to understand that you don't need to know the ins and outs of everything um, in every single library because they're all stealing stuff from each other. Um, <coughs> functional programming is something that comes up a lot. Um, a lot of the ideas here are used a lot. Um, if you use Lodash, um, the docs and the code itself are actually really, really informative. It's basically a set of utilities for combining small functions together to do bigger things. But um, a lot of the core um, concepts from functional programming are things that tend to persist, especially in the JavaScript world, maybe less so in other languages, but especially in JavaScript, you tend to see a lot of those things come out because JavaScript is built on a somewhat functional philosophy. So when you talk about reducers, you could just be talking about map, filter, and reduce the functions that are actually in like core JavaScript, or you could be talking about Redux, which uses the concept of reducers really heavily to do the exact same thing, but on a larger scale. Um, yeah, so, I mean, and I could just go through here. So like immutability is another thing that Redux uses. Pure functions is another thing that Redux uses. I'm just using that as an example. 
Um, but it does all these things, and it's not, they're just not coming out of thin air. It's like these seven or eight core ideas that are used across a ton of different libraries. Um, but uh, Redux packages them up and puts a, a brand on it. And a lot of people think, holy crap, I gotta like go learn this whole thing. But when you look at it, it's really just a composition of these really core ideas. Um, a really important thing to keep in mind with all of that is focusing on the value that you're trying to create by writing code. Most of us write code um, to solve a business problem. And um, usually it's important to solve the problem quickly and in a way that um, is, has some integrity so that like, you know the code is going to continue to function. What are the tools that are gonna help solve that problem? What are the tools that um, what are other tools like that? Like I was comparing Vue and Angular before. Like those are two ways to solve a pretty similar problem. React is another one. Um, you know, it's a, a, like in, in Node world, you could say, well, Happy and Express are two options that solve pretty much the same problem because they are just Node web servers. So you're saying, I have Node. I need to be able to serve some endpoints. Well, now I know I can pick Happy or Express and not have to worry about like these tons of other different things like um, Seneca is an, like a tool for web services and all these things that you're like, holy crap, there's this whole world of like ways to spin up a web service, but I really just need to serve up an HTTP endpoint. Um, these things solve those problems. I don't need to over-engineer something. Um, but yeah, really just using that um, critical thinking skill of, of asking whether or not something solves your problem is I think a thing that people overlook often, too often because they're wanting to use new hotness instead of the thing that actually works. Like um, a, a seasoned developer would say that like if you have a static web page and you need to be able to show um, a modal pop-up, if someone was like, oh, well, you know what? You're going to need React because, you know, that's what everybody's really using. And then like you need a modal, so you should probably get like a modal library that works with React on top of that. And then um, Redux, because you need to track some state here, so you really should just add that on too. And don't forget to use the Fetch API, because that, no one's using you know, jQuery Ajax anymore. Use Fetch. Um, but then a seasoned developer is going to be like, wait, you just need one modal on one page? Well, there's like 100 jQuery UI libraries out, libraries out there that do that. Just drop it on a page and, and style it to make it work for you. If you're over-engineering the solution to a problem, um, you're just wasting your own time and you could be doing way better things with it. This is um, probably the best lesson I've learned in my entire career is that it's okay to say I don't know. Um, <coughs> we get like hit with an onslaught of information every day and people are constantly trying to stay on top of the game and understand everything that's going on in the JavaScript community and the developer community at large. And, um, there's this constant sense that everybody else knows a little bit more than you, especially when you come to a conference, you're like, oh my God, like, I don't know anything about Docker. I don't know anything about you know, promises, whatever it is. It's like, well, one, that's why we're here at a conference, but it's also okay to be like, I just don't know that thing. And if you're honest with yourself about it, um, you don't have to really stress out about it until you need that thing. And um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, it's just to be like, okay, I don't know that thing. That's okay. Like, if, like, there's like, what, like, a hundred thousand, like, hundreds of thousands of packages in um, NPM, right? Like, there's no way any one person could know all of that stuff. So don't try. Like, you're just going to stress yourself out. Um, focus on the few things you know are going to solve the problems that you have. But, um, and when someone asks, um, you know, I'm, I don't know is more than a valid answer. And on the other side of it, don't be a part of the problem. If you ask somebody if they know something, don't act surprised. Um, that's just kind of being an asshole. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's really no other way around it. Like Lance and I were talking about this the other day at work. It's just like when you feign surprise that someone doesn't know about the new thing in some, you know, like, oh my God, you don't use like um, async and await to solve your like asynchronous function problems in Node. You're not using like the latest version of Babel. It's like all you're doing is creating this bubble. It's sort of like a real estate bubble, but it's like a bubble on knowledge where you're like inflating people's like sense of need to know all these things that they don't just they just don't need to know. 
So like people are supposed to specialize. The people who exceed in their careers are the ones who find the things that they're good at and specialize in them. It seems like overwhelming, especially when you're starting a career as like a junior developer, you've only been in it for a couple of years, where you feel like you have to know all this stuff. And it's more people treating you that you're supposed to know all this stuff than you not knowing it that's the problem. So when you have some experience, treat people with less experience in that specific thing kindly because they probably know a lot more about some other thing that you need to know too. Um, learning empathy. This is the soft part of my talk. Um, who here has read any books by Brene Brown? I think you all should. I would buy one copy of at least one of her books for every one of you if I could. There's this YouTube video that really boils down a ton of her um, work. It's like three minutes long. It's called Brene Brown on Empathy. It's on YouTube. Um, if you go watch that, it will make you a better person almost instantly in pretty much every single way, but especially as a developer, because developers have a tendency to be a little less um, empathic or at least less likely to express their empathy externally. Um, so being empathetic to, the, to the, the situations and the knowledge of the people around you is absolutely key not only for your own development, but for their development and for the health of the teams that you work on and the companies you work at. Um, recognizing needs is another thing. This book um, is another one that I wish I could buy, just copies for everybody. If anybody in here wants to borrow mine, I will gladly hand it out. Um, <coughs> Marshall Rosenberg sort of came up with a framework for um, how to speak kindly to people, which is kind of a weird thing to think about, but as, a, as, like a, as an engineer, having a framework for how to understand how other people are feeling <laughs> was actually really helpful. Um, it's basically a book that sort of lays out this whole plan for being able to, one, identify the needs of the people around you, two, be able to have a conversation where you can help figure out what their needs are, and three, being able to recognize your own needs and being able to communicate those in a way that people understand what it is that you need from them, but also being okay when they can't give that to you. So it's sort of like a two, it's all about creating this two-way conversation where you and the people around you understand how to take care of each other. Um, here's a whole list of needs from the book um, that these are core needs that every single one of us in this room and in the world need in order to survive as a healthy and well-developed adult. There's a whole list, I'm not gonna read them off obviously, but um, when all of these needs are being satisfied, we're able to be the best version of ourselves, and we're able to help the people around us to um, develop themselves into the best people they can be. And when we can understand each other's strengths and weaknesses, it's a really, really, really cool way to work because you're able to sort of like ebb and flow as a team, and you're able to be vulnerable with each other and understand that some days we have good days and bad days, and um, you know, um, just taking care of each other instead of um, just sort of being like insensitive um, to the way people are feeling at any given time. So that's just like hitting on the idea of not really um, creating a worse problem than we already have trying to keep up with everything. So to wrap up, um, this is all about learning to be a lazy programmer by using some critical thinking skills to um, to not worry about all of the shit you have to try to figure out how to learn <laughs> and just focus on the things that actually matter to the problem at hand and being able to ask questions to the people around you that you know are safe to ask questions to and also being a person who is a safe person to ask questions to. Um, but then also taking care of yourself and understanding that we are supposed to have lives outside of work. You shouldn't be going home from work after eight hours of coding and look at another four hours of tutorials and um, yeah, we all have lives, we all have hobbies, we all have things that make us the people that we are, and spending your whole time learning um, some library that's gonna not be cool again in three years, <laughs> it's not worth your time. So, like, if, if your employer's not paying you um, for those hours, then, uh, but they're expecting you to come back to, to work the next day with all that knowledge, then that's probably a good sign that you need to have a conversation with them, or maybe find a job somewhere else. There's plenty of jobs, so. I wouldn't be too stressed out about that. Um, once again, um, I'm Josh. That's really it. It's a quick and easy talk. Um, you can find me at javascriptfatigue.club. Uh, I'll be talking more about some of this stuff. I've only been blogging on there for like a week. Like I said, I just got this set up, but um, I'm gonna start sending out a newsletter pretty shortly here where I'll be talking more about some of the soft skills and critical thinking skills 
um, that we use to do our jobs as developers. So if there's any questions, you can come up to me or you can yell them out or whatever, but that's all I